Okay, so the next algorithm we're going to look at is now... This video shows the second of two practical activities. The activity is designed to help understand how algorithms and processes that might seem on a small scale to be simple become powerful when applied to problems on a larger scale in practical situations. If I want to go in order from smallest to largest, are these two cars the right way round relevant to one another? So I started with a demonstration of about eight cards and demonstrated how the algorithm would work. So it's focusing on looking at two, deciding whether to keep them or to swap them, then looking at the next two and the next two. So, so it's really drawing that algorithmic process out and really hammering it home so that they're thinking like a computer is thinking. OK. Said done. Do I know as a computer that it's done? Yeah. You've got to know have a pass and no swaps. Again. Yeah, good. So if I go through again... Good. So the fact that I've gone through without having to make a swap tells me... Four. They are asked to work in pairs and are required to move the cards physically. The teacher hopes that this would encourage them to be more explicit in describing the process and so identify the discrete elements and decisions that need to be made in sorting the cards, as a computer might. A colleague has agreed to observe and listen to their reasoning. When we were doing the card sorting, they were putting their hands on the cards. It made them think that they can only look at those two at any one time and that gave them an appreciation of, of how that problem would be more complex if there were a larger number of cars to sort. Their gut instinct was, OK, it's always going to take n minus 1 passes, but actually playing with the cards, they could see that sometimes it was, it was stopping earlier, and, and it's important that they understood why that was the case. How many times in the whole process with those eight cards okay. did you directly compare two cards? Um, you just add so it would be about seven passes. That's eight, so it'll be seven, plus six, plus five, plus four, plus three, plus two, plus one. You add each, however many number of passes up, and each pass is how many cards there are to, left to do, uh, minus one. If the nine is further to the left, and if the two is further right, it takes a lot longer for them to get to where they need to be. So I think that's where why it would take longer. It would, it would depend how far they are away from each other at the start. Let's think this time not just about the number of passes, but about the number of comparisons I'm making as well. Yes. 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 OK. Ed, how many comparisons are there? Five. Five. Let's go through my second pass. Yes. Yeah. Why not? Because uh, you know that the largest number is already at the end. Right. Now, if I carry on to the end, what's the greatest number of comparisons I might have in total? The sum of one to five. Let's just think about, again, from a computer's point of view. So, we look at those ones. Do we need to swap them? Yeah. Yes, we do. And now I'll look at these two. Swap them. And now these two. I compare these two, no need to swap. Compare these two, no need to swap. Compare these two, no need to swap. Do I now need to go through from the beginning and go again? No. So when we've had a pass with no swaps, we know that we've finished. If I start at one end and I call that card X, I would tell the computer to compare card X to X plus one. If x is larger than x plus 1, swap the cards. Uh, if not, go on to the next stage. Okay. Uh, compare x plus 1 to x plus 2. Same again, if it's larger, swap them. Isn't the stopping condition when you go all the way through and you don't have to make a swap? Good. And that's when you... So if we have, say, s is the number of swaps, what would be our condition for stopping? S when... zero. Right, so at the end of one pass, if you get to a stage where s equals 0, we can finish early. If you've already done your last swap and then you've gone through, in that whole thing, S equals 1, but you wouldn't need to go through it again yeah. to ah, so that S equals set 0. Every time you go through again, through again, you set S to 0. Yeah. It's more 
a visual, you can sort of see what you're doing. Even if you were in an exam setting, and I'd probably visualise it in my mind, I'd probably swap the cards over just because of what we've been doing. I think the turning them over visualises the computer's perspective. If they don't know where it is underneath the card as such. Yeah, because this way you're forced to think like the computer would. So I was quite pleased with the card activity that the students were touching both the cards, mm -hmm. even when they could see that they didn't have to swap them. So that idea that a computer can only compare two seems to come across very strongly. I think they found that easy to see as well with the face down version, so that might mm. be something I would do differently next time, is maybe get them to have the cards face down. At the end of that session, there was some really important reflections from the students, particularly that point that came up about, do you stop when there's no swaps? Mm. Or actually, can you stop if there's N minus one passes. These sorts of activities do help them appreciate those, those limitations and those real world concerns that you'd have to take into account if you were writing the code. Mm.